produce the toxin. Well, why should chlorella produce a toxin? Well, mosquito larvae would be consumed, uh, excuse me, would be consuming these phytoplankton. So it would be to the advantage of the phytoplankton to produce a toxin which kills mosquito larvae. So thought about it, went back to the university, talked to my colleague who's an entomologist, somebody who studies insects. I said, let's set this up. Let's do an experiment, see if I'm right. See if, in fact, chlorella produces the toxin that kills mosquitoes. Lo and behold, boom. We found in several larval stages of mosquitoes, and I grew this in the lab, they were killed by the toxin that produced by chlorella. We sit down, get all set to write it up. I check the literature. Just three months ahead of time, somebody had made the same discovery and already published it. So sometimes you get swooped. And I'd taken that trip to Maine the year before. My name would be on the publication. Doesn't matter. You discover things just by observing situations in the environment and then thinking about them. And sometimes they turn out to be important. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they turn out to be a scoop. Sometimes they don't. All right. So. Characteristic of chlor chlorophyta is that you will likely to find these kinds of organisms in tide pools because of the extreme conditions, such as salinity and heat that are present there, and also high concentrations of organic material. Think of all that falls into a tide pool and starts decomposing. When you have high concentrations of inorganic material, and high, you're going to have high concentrations of bacteria. And it turns out that these toxins produced by these organisms defend themselves against the bacteria, too. They kill the bacteria. So we have chlorophyte is not being terribly important in the ocean in general, but in certain areas, such as the intertidal zone where you have tide pools, they can dominate. Let us now go on to an organism that does play a major role in the ocean, the ocean in general. And these are the diatoms. Diatoms. If we call phytoplankton the grasses of the sea, it is the diatoms that are so abundant that these are the king of all grasses of the sea. It is the diatoms in a temperate ecosystem, a temperate marine environment, and also the colder regions as well. It is the diatoms that dominate. And so if we take the ocean in general, it is the diatoms that are most important as phytoplankton being the base of the food chain. the most important phytoplankton in the food chain because of their extraordinary numbers. Generally, these organisms are at a maximum in spring and autumn for, for reasons I will explain next segment having to do with oceans, ocean circulation. And these are organisms that you probably encounter every day and not know about it. How many people have ever driven along a highway and seen the signs, usually green signs with, uh, uh, even though your headlights aren't shining directly on the sign, you can see light reflected from the sign very easily, you know, those overhead signs? They're able to pick up a little bit of light that's shining on the road and pick it up up there so you can see at night those signs very easily. The reason you can see them is because the paint is embedded with the shells of diatoms. And diatom shells are made of glass. They're made of silica. And so basically, you have little particles of, of glass in there, which pick up the light, and they reflect the light. Diatoms, anybody got a fish tank that uh, they have at home and have to keep clean? Do you ever use it, need a filter for that fish tank? Do you use a diatom filter? That's right, you use a carbon filter. <laughs> carbon filter, OK. Well, if you ever needed to absolutely clean everything out of that fish tank, 
you would use a diatom filter. And I'll explain why in a, in, a sec in a second. It's a filter that's made out of diatom shells. All right, so let's take a look at the diatoms. First of all, they're the most abundant phytoplankton in the ocean, hence they're key in the food chain. They're maximum in spring and autumn. And they're found in various places. But before we talk about where they're found, let me give you an image of these organisms. Usually, if you look in a microscope, you will see organisms that have a round shape and some that have a boat shape, kind of like a canoe. Looking at them from the top or from the bottom, that's what they look like either a round shape or a boat shape. If you look at them from the side, both of these organisms will look exactly the same. Looking from the side, they both look like petri dishes with an upper lid and a bottom portion, just like a petri dish. How many people, anybody unfamiliar with a petri dish? Let's see if I can find one here. Petri dish has two halves. One fits inside the other. So I don't have a petri dish here. It would look more like a diatome because it's rather elongated, but it's basically the lower portion with the top portion right over it. Petri dish looks like this. And we're elongated. If you look at this from here, here's your eyeball looking down at it. Give yourself some eyelashes. Give yourself a nose and a mouth. There's a chin. Okay. You're looking down, you will either see this or this in general. These round ones, and I'm being a little inexact here, and I'll explain what exact means later. These would be called centric diatoms. Centric diatoms. And these would be called pennate diatoms. Centric diatoms and pennate diatoms. Generally, the centric diatoms are found in open water. So open ocean, or let's say open water. They're really usually part of the plankton, so we'll write planktonic. Planktonic. Whereas the boat shaped ones, I'll be with you in a second, because the boat shaped ones are generally found, and I'm being, being very broad here, I'm talking about most of the round ones are found in the open ocean, most of the pennate ones are found at on some surface. And when they're attached to a surface, they're said to be apontic. <laughs> so we've got apontic diatoms and pennate diatoms. And as soon as I answer your question, I will discuss the word planktonic so you have a better appreciation for exactly what I mean. Yes, go ahead. I just want to know if I could use the restroom. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I'll be back in class. Yep. All right. So, Are we allowed to exit the destroyer? Yep. Okay. So, let's take a, the word plank, take a look at the word planktonic for a minute. Planktonic, or plankton. I think I addressed this already in connection with the Hardy Plankton Recorder, but I'll repeat it. The word plankton has, comes from the same root word as planet. If you study the, the, the night sky, you'll see that the stars all seem to stay in one place in relation to each, other, to each other, but the planets just zigzag all over the place. So the word planet and plankton basically come from the word that means wanderer. Wanderer. And with regard to the plankton, it means that these organisms are so small, 
they really can't determine where they go. It, they're pretty much pushed around by currents. They're pushed around by currents. Hence, plankton are small organisms that can't determine their own direction of movement. To a degree, they can, but in majority, they can't. They're wanderers, so to speak. All right, so how does this square with calling these planktonic and these apontic? Apontic meaning they're on a surface. Well, in the open ocean, generally, you will find the centric diatoms, but lots of times there will be apontic diatoms that are released from where they're attached, and they become part of the plankton then. So when we talk about an apontic diatom, they can be part of the plankton when they are released from the surface, and they also would be wandering around the water. All right, so diatoms are planktonic, but these are pretty much always in the water column. These are often attached to a surface. Well, let's take a closer look at these organisms so that you can understand them better. Let's take a look first at these centric diatoms. When we look at a centric diatom, we see that they have lines radiating out from the center of the organism. These lines, or stripes, are called striae, S-T-R-I-A-E. Striae. And if you take a close look at the striae, you will see that the striae consists of a whole bunch of holes lined up like this. And so it appears to be a straight line. It appears to be a solid line, but it really consists of a whole bunch of holes all lined up. And these holes are called puncta. P-U-N-C-T-A. So you've got a whole bunch of puncta lined up, making it look like a stripe. That's from the top view. Yeah, so if you're looking down on this, you have those stripes like that from the top view and the bottom view. Well, glad you asked that. Let me define what, what I'm talking about. When we take a look at a diatom, each one of these halves of the shell is called a valve. So to answer your question from a valve view, you would see the striae. This would be the girdle view. When you look at it from the side, that's the girdle. So that's the girdle view of a diatom. Now, what's the purpose of these puncta? Well, these are the valves and the flesh of the organism, the living material, the cytoplasm of the diatom is inside it. The living material has to be able to exchange wastes and exchange nutrients with the outside, with the seawater. So nutrients need to be coming in, wastes need to come out, Gases like carbon dioxide comes in, oxygen goes out. And so there have to be little holes in the surface. And those little holes are arranged as I showed you. Those little holes are puncta. And they simply allow communication with the outside world. They allow the, the interchange of materials that are important to be interchanged with the environment. If you look at a pennate diatom, the striae are arranged perpendicular 
to the axis. The striae are arranged perpendicular to the longitudinal axis. So, centric diatoms are characterized by having the striae radiate from the central axis. Here, they're perpendicular. Well, I should, I should say radiate from the center. Here, they're perpendicular to the longitudinal axis. So sometimes you'll see an organism that the diatom that looks round, but if you take a look at the striae and you see the striae perpendicular, then it's really a pennate diatom. If you see something that looks like this, but the striae were to radiate outwards rather than be perpendicular, then you know it's a centric diatom. It's the position of the striae that make the difference. Well, who gives a damn? It's important, why? It's important because most of these are in the plankton all of the time, and these can be in the plankton, but they can also be epontic. And that can be important for a whole bunch of organisms, as I'll explain in a moment. Let's first take a look at what epontic means, or what the different kinds of epontic diatoms are. What what different things can they be attached to? So basically now we're going to see the subset of what it means to be an epontic diatom. There are some diatoms which are epiphytic, epiphytic. That's one word, but I just broke it into two. What do you suppose phytic means? I could say epiphytic. Should ring a bell. What's your guess? It refers to plants. Epi means on top of. So here we're talking about diatoms that grow on the surface of plants. So let's suppose you had some rooted vegetation, blades of eelgrass like that. You would have diatoms attached to it. right on the surface. You could have some epontic diatoms that are epizoic. Now you've got to tell me what that means. What does that mean? Epizoic. On top, of on top of animals, exactly. What kind of animals would have diatoms on it? Whales have diatoms stuck to the surface. And then we have diatoms that are epilithic. What do you suppose that means? Anybody take a geology course? It means they're on the surface of rocks. They're on the surface of rocks. And if you recall, when we went to Long Island Sound, I said be very careful walking on rocks that are dark. In fact, don't walk on rocks that are dark because they can be very slippery. They're just coated with diatoms, which will make the rock very slippery. And in fact, these epilithic diatoms play an important role in keeping rocks from eroding. They keep rocks from eroding. How do they do that? Well, suppose you had a rock like this. All right? Water pounds on it, constantly rushing on it. Yeah, every time water passes by, it takes one little particle after another after another. But suppose this rock is covered with diatoms, the diatoms protect it. And if you wash away a diatom, all the diatoms just reproduce and replace it. It's kind of the same significance as a coral reef. Think about an island that's surrounded by a coral reef. Now you might look at this island and say, hey, if the coral reef wasn't there, the ocean could come in here and just erode away the island, take away the island. So the coral reef plays a critical role in 
preventing that surge of water from getting to the island and eroding it, taking away all the soil. Then you might say, oh, so I tell you what, let's kill the coral reef and just build a brick wall around it. So we build a brick wall around the island under the water, an imitation coral reef. Will that do just as well? Well, ask anybody who went through Hurricane Sandy. You wipe away brick walls. The ocean will easily wear away and destroy those brick walls. How come the ocean doesn't destroy a coral reef? Because a coral reef is a living structure that can replace itself. The ocean does wear away coral reefs, and just as fast as it's worn away, it's replaced by the living organisms that make up that reef. So, just as coral reefs with their living animals are able to protect an island because they replace themselves, even though the ocean war would take some of them away. So diatoms play a major role on rocks by protecting rocks. If the <coughs> some of them get washed away, they just get replaced by others that reproduce there. So having a living structure around you is much better than having a dead structure, a non-living structure. Because non-living structures can't replace themselves. The living structures do. Yes? What is, um, I don't know what, what, is, what does it protect the rocks from? It protects the rocks from being worn away. Worn away. Yeah. <coughs> All right. So we can have diatoms that are apontic, meaning either epilithic, excuse me, epiphytic, epizoic, epilithic, or epipelic. Epipelic means they live on the surface of the mud. And there they play a very important role in feeding organisms that graze on the mud. That would include lots of polychaetes and snails. And those polychaetes and snails are then fed upon by birds and fish. So they're important in the marine food chain. All right. If you're an apontic organism, which means that you're on a surface, you might want to move around that surface. And in fact, these pennate diatoms are able to do that because they have on their underside a little groove. And that groove is called a wraith. I'll show you to on side view, on girdle view, I should say. Here would be a wraith. Here's a wraith right over here, and here's a wraith right over there. Usually they're on the underside. And the wraith is an opening through which the protoplasm, the living material of the diatom, can extend <coughs> and so push themselves along the surface. You know, it's kind of like you in a boat. And you don't have a paddle, but you have a pole. And you take the pole and you push it down into the surface and you, into the underwater surface, and you push yourself along. Well, they simply push out some of the protoplasm and they move themselves along. If you have a petri dish with gel on it, with auger on it, a gel-like material, and you put diatoms on it, Within 12 to 24 hours, the diatom that started here will now be over here. And you'll see a little groove in that gel, which is the track made by the diatoms. So they're able to push themselves along because they can extend their cytoplasm out through the wraith. Centric diatoms don't have it. They're always in the plankton. So they don't need it. All right. So we have adaptations for their habitat. Centric diatoms are open ocean, always part of the plankton, open water. Pennate diatoms often attached. And to move on what they're attached to, they have a wraith and used as I described. 
And if we take a look at reproduction, we also have adaptations that correspond to their environment. Centric diatoms produce flagellated gametes. What's a gamete? Well, for us, egg and sperm are gametes. They join together and you get a fertilized, you get a brand new organism. For pennate diatoms, you have amoeboid gametes. What's an amoeba? An amoeba is an organism that can take on any shape that it wants to take on. And it can crawl along. It can basically spill itself. It wants to move in this direction, it just simply spills itself in that direction. Cytoplasm just flows off in that direction. Crawling on the surface. So penate diatom, which is usually attached to a surface, hey, you have an amoeboid gamete, that's suitable for living on the surface. So you see, the centric and pennate diatoms are adapted to the particular environments that they favor. The pennate diatoms can crawl. Centric diatoms have no need to do that. They're not on the surface. They produce different types of gametes because they have different types of habitat. When the gametes are produced and fertilization occurs, you have a very interesting situation. What will happen is this. The two gametes get together. How come I don't call them egg and sperm, by the way? Because that's, oh, they asexually reproduce, right? What? Because they asexually reproduce. No. This is sexual reproduction, in a, in a way. But you're, you're, I know, you're driving along the same line I'm about to go to. And it comes down to this. When we talk about sex, we're talking about male and female. And the male gamete swims, the female gamete doesn't. It's an egg. Okay? So when we talk about egg and sperm, we're talking about gametes which have different motility characteristics. One moves, the other one doesn't. When we take a look at these organisms, both in quotes, sexes produce a modal gamete, whether that be a flagellated gamete or a, an amoeboid gamete. In other words, we don't have sexual dimorphism, what that means. Morphos refers to shape, dimorphos, two shapes. We don't have two different shapes of gametes. They look the same. You couldn't tell one, one apart from the other. But they know what's, I'm going to say male and female, but it doesn't fit. They, you got two different types that get together, and as long as they know they're two different types, everything works out okay. You know, like you can only have reproduction with in, in mammals with males and females. Doesn't work with two females, doesn't work with two males. Here, you can't see male and female, but you got two different types. This, they're types. So it kind of confuses the language. We're used to talking about sexuality. There, it's not sexuality, it's just different types. Because we don't have one gamete that swims and one gamete that sits still. Anyway, so here's how it works. The gametes fuse and produce a structure called an oxospore. It's an oxospore. And this oxospore then, well, actually, it grows larger, so I'll just show it this way because that's important. It gets bigger, kind of swells, and it produces a membrane around it called the perizonium. It produces a membrane around it called the perizonium, and within this perizonium, a new shell will form. In this perizonium, a new shell will form.
So that's, that's sexual reproduction, in quotes, because well, it's as close as we can relate. There aren't males and females, but there are two different types that get together, two different types of gametes. So it's a kind of sexual reproduction without males and females, but yet two different types. And that's how this so-called sexual reproduction occurs. Reproduction can also occur simply by division, binary division. This divides, and now you got two that look like this. This divides, and now you got two that look like that. I'm going to go into some more details about that division because it produces a very strange situation. How many of you have heard of Zeno's hypothesis? <clears throat> All right, Zeno's hypothesis is this. Just listen, don't write it down yet. You'll see what relevance it has, All right? Now, for me to go from this side of the room to that side of the room, I have to walk from here to there, right? And before I can walk from here to there, I have to walk half that distance, right? And before I can walk half that distance, I have to walk half that distance. And before I can walk half that distance, I have to walk half that distance until I'm moving an infinitesimal amount. And since you cannot move an infinitesimal amount, it is impossible for me to walk from here to there. This is known as logic. And it doesn't make any sense. Because you know I can walk from here to there. Okay? But think of how you can break down one way of thinking. Say if I go from here to there, I gotta go half first and then half and half. I can't go an infinitesimal amount, so I can never get from there to there. Well, when we take a look at diatome reproduction, we have an equally odd situation. When we take a look at binary fission, dividing in two to reproduce, this asexual reproduction, it works like this. Here's the top half of the diatome, here's the bottom half of the diatome, here's the diatome living inside. In order for reproduction to occur, the two valves separate. So there's one, there's the other one. And now you got living organism there, living organism there. This upper shell, this upper valve is called the epitheca. This lower valve is called the hypotheca. Now theca is just another word for shell. There are lots of words for shells. And we got shell, we got theca, we got frustule, we got all kinds of things. But theca just refers to the shell. An upper epi, a lower hypo. Yes, you had a question. Oh, thank you very much. Okay. Thanks for the reminder. People in the camera, you have heard that. Here you go. Okay, this is the epitheca, and this is the hypotheca. And when diatoms reproduce by fission, by dividing in half, uh, here's the organism in there, what happens is this material divides in half, and now you have the epitheca with half, and you have the hypotheca with the other half. And now each half has to produce the other half of the shell. I'm going to label this epi with an E. I'm going to label this H with a, with a hypo with an H. But the strange thing that happens is, instead of producing the half of the shell that's supposed to produce, both halves produce a hypotheca. Both halves produce a hypotheca. So, the half with the original epitheca, that's going to remain the same size. The half with the original hypotheca, that's going to be smaller. And then, Think of what's going to happen when this reproduces. This will have an epitheca and a hypotheca. We'll put it in using the dotted lines. And when this reproduces, and this, this then will become the epitheca, and it'll produce an even smaller hypotheca. And then when this reproduces, It'll get smaller and smaller and smaller because it keeps producing a hypotheca, which becomes the epitheca. It keeps getting smaller and smaller. 
Tell me if you see what I'm talking about. You don't? Anybody? It's all right? So eventually, the diatome will disappear. It'll get so small, it will disappear. And this is fission? What? This is fission? This is fission, right. It should disappear. That's like moving from here to the other side of the room. I can't get there. Why not? Because I can't have to moving half and half and half and half, and that can't be done. Well, it doesn't disappear. Eventually, it reaches <laughs> such a small size, a critical small size, that it starts reproducing using gametes. And in the perizonium is formed the shell that is of maximum size for that species. So it finally changes its method of reproduction and now it goes back to its original size. It doesn't disappear. of other things I need to tell you about diatoms. First of all, this shell is made of silica. Basically, that's what glass is, silica. It is transparent just like glass. It is glass. And it's got a lot of holes in it. The striae, which are puncta, lots of holes. And some of these, the pennate ones, have a rafe down here, lots of holes. All right, so what do we got? We got the puncta and the striae. We got the epitheca and the hypotheca. And when you take a look at a Petri dish, you will see that <coughs> here's the upper lid over here, coming down to there. The lower lid comes to here. And when you look at a diatome, these look like stripes going across like that. Or they look like bands. These are called intercalary bands. Intercalary bands. Which are simply the visible portion of each shell, one overlapping or one inside the other. Just as you look in a petri dish, you see these intercalary <laughs> bands. I mention that because when you see the diatoms, and you'll have them in one of the labs I have set up, uh, you'll wonder what, what the stripe is in the middle. That's what that stripe is. It's the intercalary bands going across. Now, besides the anatomy of the diatome of each individual diatoms, sometimes diatoms form colonies. And one of these colonies almost gave me a heart attack. I was working on my PhD. One of the organisms I was uh, working out the physiology of um, was a single diatome that looked like this. And part of my research was to understand all of its physiological requirements. These were all organisms that came from heavily polluted waters. And that related my, to my research as well. So I needed to understand its physiology, what it required, how much light it required, what kind of nutrients it required, all kinds of stuff. And you need to maintain a bacteria-free free culture. I had to create it. I took this organism from a, a highly, con I took it from East River, New York City, loaded with sewage, loaded with industrial waste. And I had to clean all the bacteria off it so that when I tested its physiology, I would know that if I added certain kind of nitrogen to the water, I would know that it's this organism that's consuming nitrogen, not some bacteria that's